All right, folks, welcome back to It's a Bit. Special guest on with us tonight, we have Anthony LaPanta, Minnesota Wild play-by-play, also the anchor on Twins Live for Fox Sports North. I would also call him the Gordon Ramsay of the Midwest. Would you agree with that statement, Anthony? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. We certainly give it a shot. We enjoy cooking. I'm not, I don't think anything's at his level yet, but we'll, we're getting there. Yeah, I don't know if, yeah. any, if anyone can relate where you're like on Twitter late at night and you're hungry and then you see one a picture Anthony posts and you're like, damn it, there's my appetite back just like that. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I was say too, well Anthony, we had a little you... too much time off with the COVID shutdown. Yeah. We had a few more few more nights in the kitchen than we were expecting. And we've actually, we were just talking about it last night as we were making dinner that, you know, we're, we basically had about 300 of the last 315 dinners in our house because we can't go anywhere else anyway, even if we wanted to. So it's a good thing we have a little variety. Well, I was going to ask too, have you ever done the, the, I don't know if you call it the bit, I mean, but where you tweet at Gordon Ramsay, your dish, see if he rates it or he tweets it. I don't know if you've ever done he that. He tears apart everyone. He though. tears apart everybody. doesn't matter. Yeah, who it is. no, I haven't done that. We did have, I had somebody else that, replied to a tweet and challenged Gavin Kaysen, who's one of the great local chefs and said, Hey, why don't, how about you two guys a cook off and I want to be one of the judges. And they threw out a couple other names for people that they wanted to be the judges and said, we'll, we'll get it organized. It'll be in his kitchen. And Gavin, who I happen to know personally and is a great guy. And he, he's the chef at spoon and stable, which is one of my favorite restaurants in town. And he replied right away saying, yep, I'm in, I'll do it. You bring your knives and, and let's get after it. So that's nice. the closest thing to that. We never actually did it, but it would be fun. You could do a whole Rocky montage when you're training. Except it's for cooking. He, he, right. He'd probably, uh, you said he's like a head chef. He'd probably be like the uh, Dolph Lundgren gym, and you'd be more of like the Rocky in the cabin type thing. But Right, with the log over there. my shoulder. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we can give you, it a shot. Yeah. Be fun. Be awesome. Yeah. We'll, we'll cover it as 10,000 stakes. Well, we, we can, well, if that's like an actual cook-off event, we can be the, uh, we can be the commentators. We could be the uh, yeah. talent for we'll that. We'll do play-by-play. We'll How do play-by-play. Oh, look at that flip of the steak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. We just have to make sure that we keep our fingers safe that day. Cause that would be a bad one. It'd be a bad day to slice off the fingertip trying to keep up with Gavin. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I would probably, I'd probably um, get lost in the action. I wouldn't, I wouldn't catch the shot filming, but uh, <laughs> have you ever seen that video of Kirk cousins where he's grilling the steak in the tinfoil? You probably cringed at that one. Huh? He's, he has it. On I have not No. Okay, well, that's in probably tinfoil? your nightmare, right? Yeah, he hasn't. Yeah, because he didn't want the juices yeah. to get out. He kind of missed nah. that. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> that's bad. And and you might as well, if you're gonna do that, just get, make a hamburger. Yeah, I I think that's the most Kirk thing to do. Yeah, if probably. You, is. I mean, that makes sense for Kirk. He's you probably know, doing it cook in, like that. And uh, white calf socks and flip flops as well to go full. Uh, <laughs> To go full uniform, but what's what's the best thing you've been cooking lately? I know you've been you've been working a lot. You're at the X right now for the game, but yeah, I mean my my favorite is my go to is steaks, and I, I love the we the Akiyushi steaks are the best. So when we have them, which we had last night, that's the way we go. But I actually, I think the best thing I the two things I've added lately to the to the cookbook, so to speak, even though it's a mythical cookbook because it's all just mentally. Well, you is don't the want world's... to give your secrets away, so that's... Well, I actually, you know, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's not that. It's more just that I don't take the time to write anything down, so it's all just make it up as you go along, and we've... Yep. So, and there's two of them that, have, that would kind of define that. One is, we call it the world's greatest chicken sandwich, and the, we just made them on Wednesday night. It was my fourth attempt, and I think now I've got it. It's They're awesome sandwiches. It's a... A little bit of a just kind of a pan fried chicken breast and avocado tomato pickle uh, spicy mayo that's homemade that's a like a actual it's a healthy mayo like no actual yeah. crap in it and then it's got a slaw a homemade slaw that's uh, like a citrusy vinegary slaw that um, it's awesome so anyway the the world's greatest chicken sandwich is one of the new additions and then I came up with this new sauce for seafood we had it on scallops a couple weeks ago and had it on jumbo shrimp last night that's uh that i really like so those are the two like new additions that are that just have been recent add-ons to the lapanta family menu and so far we're big fans 
but uh, the world's greatest chicken sandwich is going to stick for a while. This one, that's is this so, is one of my new favorites. So this is a bold claim. You're saying you could go head to head with Chick Fil A, Popeyes, the whole the whole gang. <laughs> that could that could be your second cook off. Is bring it on, sandwiches. bring Giants. it on. I'm ready. Yeah, it's like a different it league. It almost sounds like Anthony that you could you could join like one of those cooking competition shows like Top Chef or or Chopped or whatever it is. Oh yeah, we could have like yeah. a whole. <laughs> I don't know. It's you know I've I've watched a couple of those and I'm not not enough to really even fully understand their concept. But one of them I watched one night was like where it was a race and and that I think I could handle because we ra- we're scrambling all the time in the kitchen. Like we had a yeah. we had a uh, we did the feast of seven fishes at Christmas time. It's an old it's the Italian Italian tradition for Christmas Eve dinner. We did it on the 23rd, but seven different kinds of fish and our family of six was together and to try to make sure that like all of them were done at exactly the same time like that is the one part of cooking that i'm relatively confident in my ability like i can time all that stuff to make sure it's all ready but we were racing in the kitchen like you know grab that pan move that pan over there the shallots have to get in there right now somebody's got to run out to the grill and flip the snapper i mean it was it was pretty good but see that's that's kind of how I do it because I don't know how people find all the time in the day to like cook something, how they spend hours preparing. I, that's, I can't do it. So even if I was eating something, you know, on the fancier side, I I would try to cook it as fast as I could. I'd probably have to get in an athletic position to do it. Yeah. Well, and it's sometimes it's not like it, it isn't necessarily that you're trying to cook it fast. It's that you have to act fast because something is in order to get this done at the same time as that and the same time as that. Oh, you got a takes, lot going on. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's ah. what I'm saying. Yeah, so like you got, hey, this is going to take 25 minutes. So I know that's got to get on the stove at this time in order for it to be done. And this is going to take seven minutes. So we got to get that when, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of scrambling going on and my kids are always willing to help. So it's, we have some fun with it, but that, so the cooking show I watched, like they were under the gun, like when the clock hit zero, they had to throw their plate on the, you know, to the judges. And that part of it, I think I might be able to handle as far as like what the quality would be. I don't know if I'm at their level or not, but I know I'd have it done on time to set in front of them. Might not be with more than about four seconds to spare, but I'd have it. Well, when are you going? When are you going to teach uh, Fallness some of these uh, cooking tactics? Had to cover it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, when the guy you got a guy who eats like it's an idea of a gourmet meal when he go, goes to McDonald's and gets the Happy Meal. I mean, that's not <laughs> you know, it's just sometimes people just don't appreciate it. So we're going to stick to the crowd that we like and the crowd that enjoys it. And I don't know, we'll see. I see him around here sometimes, and you know, they bring out the hot dogs and chips. He's in heaven, so it's perfect. <laughs> He's sneaking around the trail of hot yeah, dogs. Yeah, yeah, he's just waiting over there for the guy to show up so he can grab a couple extra and throw them in his pockets, I think. He's yeah. probably like that that first guy over there to come by and tell everybody, hey, there's hot dogs over there. Like, right, right. He's the first guy to announce that's it. That's like Bubba. Yeah, it's yeah, the same that, guy. That's the same well, and, uh And what we were going to say is uh, I think you commented on one of our podcast clips about Fallen This being banned, and you said that is quote, unquote, not a bit. Which I think is it's probably not the a first, bit. Not first a time on the show that we've not had a bit, so that that uh, <laughs> that does break some sort of record. Yeah, no, it's not a bit. He has never been invited. Will never be invited. He he was near the bottom of the list to start with, and he fell even further when he, you know, started repeatedly posting a picture of a tree that fell on my grill. So yeah. he's out. Yeah, that's probably a pretty traumatic experience for you. I can't blame you. What about his yeah. hashtag? That's uh. Hashtag mute TV. Do you think that's a, a feasible thing for the average sports fan? Well, I mean, if you want to go back into the dark ages, I mean, right now we <laughs> we have moving pictures on tele. You can you can enjoy things on television. I mean, I yep. I love listening to sports on the radio. I did when I was growing up, but that was because the games weren't all on TV. I mean, now they're on TV, so you know yep. there's. You got radio irrelevancy, and or you have TV where you can watch it and see it and enjoy it. So I guess you know if, if you're driving in the car and you, it's not safe to be watching you know video while you're driving, then go ahead and listen to the radio. And other than that, you know once you're at home and you're ready to watch, why in the world would you listen to the radio? <laughs> it's it's a second tier. It's like a second tier sports you know experience it's visual it's TV well that goes but then first. like 1960 happened so that's yeah we had the tv unfortunately exactly are, are, are you aware of uh fullness's uh what does he take pictures of his feet 
Yeah, have Is you seen the Fault in this Foot pictures? The Fault in this Foot pictures? No, I'm not aware of, of that, thankfully. Feet. Yeah, may, may, maybe you, you know, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. I, I, yeah. well, how often do we see, we just see a picture on our Twitter feed, just that, falling us sitting up in the booth at the XL and we just see his feet. Yep. It's like, oh, okay. He's, he is just, that right? He's, Are you, is this a real thing? This, this yeah. Is, this is legit. Yeah. Well, I guess he, oh. uh, he, he was at a, his kid's baseball game or something and his foot got in a picture and people were just roasting him about it. So now he, his feet have to be in, in his photo, but enough on falling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're all right. Yeah, let's this move on not, to relevant topics. Yes, this is speaking of relevant. This is probably my favorite story that you're involved in. You did tell it on our stream back in May, but we have a lot more listeners now that need to hear it. The Burt Bly Levin gaffe with a few f bombs in a matter of five seconds on Twins post game. Just kind of tell that story again from your point of view because it's absolute gold, and and the and the viewers need to hear it. Yeah, it was. Can't remember the year for sure. It was late late like 2000s like maybe 2006 7 somewhere in that neighborhood and i was filling in for dick bramer doing play-by-play for the twins in new york on a sunday afternoon and we were doing our little open before the the show before the game i mean it's only five minutes maybe four minutes in length and it was a couple segments bert thought it was taped it was live and (laughs) So he's, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what I had tossed him, but he was, he was then talking through a video package and he was, we were basically previewing the game as a matchup at the time. Joe Maurer was in the batting race with Derek Jeter. So he was talking about, we're going to see two of the best hitters and Derek Jeter did this on Friday and this on Saturday and Joe Maurer did this. Well, he stumbled and he got behind the video. And so then all of a sudden he just says, and well, we're going to have to do the whole effing thing over again. Cause I just <laughs> effed it up. <laughs> and I just kind of froze and looked at him. My producer's yelling in my ear, like, what, what did he just say? What did just do something? And I was like, well, uh, Bert, we're live. And Oh, and we're live. I didn't realize. <laughs> so then he, he keeps talking. And the, one of the, one of the funnier parts of the story was my son, Vinny, who would have been, you know, I don't know, maybe eight, some eight, nine years old at home at the time. So I get a text from my wife. And this is, you know, this is so, so it's a Sunday day game in New York. So it's probably noon back in the Twin Cities. And she texts me and says, hey, Vinny just came in the kitchen and said, Bert swore on TV. And I was like, uh, yep, Vinny's right. It's, yeah, that's exactly that what happened. Nope. Yep. Yeah. So it was uh, that was it was a day I'll never forget. And we still I, in fact, the guy who was the producer is uh, he I just worked with him again. He doesn't work in the Twin Cities anymore. He's now the producer for the Chicago White Sox and we just worked a couple college football games together during the pandemic in November and we so we were out in Vegas together for one weekend and then we were in Reno Nevada another weekend and one of the nights we were sitting in the casino after the show and that story came up because like my analyst had never heard it and and it was just funny being back with him again to hear the story from both of our perspective and you know what he was dealing with because he's got the big wigs in la calling him in the truck like hey you got this is bert's got to say this he's got to do this we got to retract this we got to apologize for this and so he's dealing with all that and and i was just trying to keep bert from worrying about the fact that he was likely to be disciplined, maybe suspended. It turned out they did suspend yeah, him for a week. The and, game. Yeah. Right. And so I was just yeah. trying to, I didn't want him to worry about it. And so I had made a little tote board, like consecutive half innings since Bert last swore. And I was, Hey Bert, we're up to seven, <laughs> you know, good for you. Nice. And congratulations. And tr- yep. Trying to yeah. kind of make a joke of it to, to keep him going. And, but it, you know, I mean, that's, that's Bert. He's a, he's a funny guy he's he's got a little bit of a foul mouth to him and it's yeah. a mistake you can't make i mean in all seriousness when you're in this business you cannot you have to assume that the microphone is live all the time and yeah and you also have to know what time it is so you have to know that okay it's it's one o'clock i mean we're on live right now and it's it was a it was a bad mistake now we can kind of look back on it and laugh and actually one of the there was a guy who was who used to produce all the TV commercials for the Twins who had an awesome idea that never made it to the air 
so I can share it with you guys now. He because he had called me and said, "Hey, would you be up for being a part of this commercial?" So if, I don't know if you guys remember, like the Twins had some great commercials. Like when they first were opening Target Field, they had the one where Anaheim came to town and the guy got his tongue stuck on the flagpole, and yep. they had so there was this line of commercials. They had like the the moving company, they were hitting balls and like Bro- Morno and Maurer were hitting home runs out of the new yep. target field and hit one through a guy's windshield yeah. and Tom Kelly walks by and, oh, that's a shame. You know, so, I mean, it was, they had these great commercials. So he calls me one off season and said, hey, I got this idea for a commercial. Would you be up for it? So the gist of the commercial was going to be the bus for the Twins winter caravan pulls up in some nondescript, you know, at some stop sign. And the camera just shows like a typical Minnesota slush curb puddle, you know, like you got everywhere downtown for basically, you know, five months out of the year here where it's just yeah. that gray yeah. shit, you know? Yeah. Exactly. So the guy, sorry about that. So the guy, they were going no, to show allowed like to swear on this show. So you're, okay, you're good. good. So yep. the guy, they're showing the guys get off the bus and they just keep showing like the feet only like jumping over this puddle. And then all of a sudden you get one foot that steps right in the middle of the puddle and he just blurts out, you know, cusses and they pan up and it's Bert. And then they, they wanted to have me like lean out the window of the bus and say, but Bert, we're live. And, you know, so I, I thought it would have been a great commercial. The the twins at the time thought it was a little too soon, a little, Mm. I, yeah, I, I assume. Sure. I mean, I never talked to anybody with the twins for why they didn't do it, but it, I thought it was a brilliant idea. It would have been a great commercial. And the real ones would have understood it. Yeah. And, but you, you know what? I mean, right. a lot of people might not get it to this day, but you could, you should just do it now. I mean, yeah. maybe it's well, I mean, not as much. You know, now it's, it's old enough news. Now this was, yeah. I can't remember how many years after it, maybe it was like two or three years after it had happened. So the twins, I think were probably just worried that, you know, it's a little too fresh and, we don't want to offend, you know, there probably were some people who didn't find it funny and, you know, so it, it it's okay. But it, anyway, I just thought it was a, it would have been a funny no, I'm commercial. Gonna be, I'm going to be dead honest with you, Anthony. We probably use that line like daily in here. It's some, so someone funny. always blurts it out. Oh, we're live. I didn't know that. Like and just then, and then Tory yeah. Hunter went seven Hunter for ten, yeah. like just <laughs> right. so normal. Right. It's like, but, it's, but every time you see a, you hear a gaffe happen on the air like that, it, it's always followed up with something like fourth down and nine. Like, like the, the, there, there's always something so awkward or like someone's trying to put it back yeah, on how, track. How do you recover? You, you don't recover from you, that. You just got to keep going. Yeah. You, there's just, you can't, you're not going to respond. Bert, you just swore on live TV when yeah. you're live. You right. Well, now you're going. putting more attention on it. So you, but, yeah. yeah and I mean, we have, all you can do at that point is apologize for it and move on. But it's, it, uh, it, you know, I mean, it's funny because I get asked about that. I, you know, for sure, I, I'm going to say it's for sure in the top all time. I, I get asked about it probably as much as any game or broadcast I've ever done. But even to this day, which is 15 years later, I still get asked about it, you know, probably I'd say once a month or something. I'll have somebody yeah. come up and sure. say, hey, I just I mean, saw this clip or I just I, somebody just retweeted this. I mean, what, 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 the, what was the story with that? And it is funny how long a, of a life it's had. We uh we tweet it every year from the day it happened. I think we've been yep, pretty good about that right. for like the last two years. We it, always make it, sure it resurfaces. Well, it's, it's arguably like the the Bill O'Reilly moment of sports. You know, like, yeah, we're live. Fuck it, we're doing we're it live. Doing it live. It's, <laughs> it's the sports version of that. So I, I don't know. Have you have you talked to like? Does Bert talk about it? I mean, would he t- would he, is he open about is it? Is he or? open about it? Would he talk about it if you asked? Well, him obviously, he got in some trouble for that. Yeah, and yeah, fun to deal with, but. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he and I have talked about it many times over the years. Um, I don't know that I don't think it's his proudest moment for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I think he probably just downplays it now to I haven't really heard people ask him about it publicly. And, you know, that's I'm sure he'd just assume the story goes away and he'd like to be remembered for about a million other shows that he's done other than that one. Yeah, well, and out of all the broadcasts that you do, like, what percentage of that is one broadcast? It's incredible how you guys can go without accidentally dropping an F-bomb every now and then because I know I do it. But kind of on that same topic, Brodeen's F-bomb this year with Gorg. Uh, I mean, th- you know, just yeah. another good good example of it, just, how it, it just happens. happens. Yep. It's it, beautiful. It does, and it's 
you know, and he immediately apologized. And, you know, I mean, it, we, I remember another, we had Thomas Vanek who did the same thing one time in a, you know, I think it might've even been with Gorg. It was in a post game interview and, or an intermission interview. It was an intermission interview and he was describing a goal and, you know, kind of said the same thing. And it's, I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's such a normal conversational, uh, just a part of the vocabulary for a lot of these guys that you can understand how it just slips sometimes. And especially oh, yeah. Yeah. when you're in the heat of the moment and you're wearing, you're sweaty, you're in your gear. I mean, yeah. those guys don't have conversations with each other on the ice very often that don't involve, yeah, you know, dropping F bombs in there, yeah. adjectives, nouns, and verbs in the same sentence possibly. And yeah. so it, it, I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often in those settings Obviously, our microphones pick it up on the ice sometimes and probably more so now in empty yeah. arenas. And even that, you know, we're really we're trying to watch for it because, uh, yeah, I mean, we can kind of laugh and joke about it. But the reality is it's, you know, you got you got kids watching these games at home and mm -hmm. it's there's not it, it isn't right. It's not it, there's not a good place for it in these shows. And, you know, I mean, this is you know it's not a podcast it's not a you know it's it's not after dark tv so it's yeah we do have to be exactly. careful about it and it's well sometimes it makes some of us chuckle yeah we also have to respect the fact that there's a lot of people out there who are more offended by it than humored by it well here's a proposed idea you know how the nfl did uh the nickelodeon version of football why don't we do an adult version of hockey where yep authentic like HBO. authenticity the this is what they're actually saying on the ice. Like this guy just called this guy chicken shit. Like we can say that over the air because you check the box. It said you're 18 yeah. when you watch it. Set it up on pay-per-view HBO. Yeah. That's well, what I'm saying. you know, we've joked about that a few times like when we'd be sitting in the studio after doing a pre or post game show. And, and as we sit and watch the game, which I do like during the baseball season and I love it. We'll sit in the, do the pregame show and then I sit in the studio and watch the game with Tim Laudner or Royce Molly or somebody. And I mean, the, those two and a half, three hours of watching the game, it's fascinating to me. I learned so much about the game, but we've talked about it a number of times. Like as we're sitting there watching the game, we're like two guys in the bar. So our commentary is a little bit different than what the one is that's going over the air. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've joked about that sometimes like, you know, be nice if you could just throw the mic in here and have this be the show, but yeah. who knows? Uh, it's, it's it, I'm sure someday we're going to get to these spots where people can select their audio. Do you want to have the normal broadcast or do you want to have the two or guys filtered. sitting at the corner bar unfiltered? I mean, it, I'm <laughs> sure I wouldn't shock me if some, I mean, we've already got spots now where people can like go and direct their own broadcast basically and pick their own camera angles and everything. I mean, Who's to say we won't be there with announcers sometime soon? Well, uh, do you guys remember? I don't know if you saw the video where Kel Kevin Harlem like commented again. Yeah, who was I streaking. did see that. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if someone does that on the ice, you have to do it for the for the wild. You have to do your own play by play. <laughs> yeah. A streaking guy on the ice. That'd be interesting. <laughs> I think it's unlikely to happen well in works. a hockey rink, but we'll see. Say. Or we've seen those old videos of like this would probably never happen anymore, but like literally hockey players starting to get in brawls with the fans. Yeah. Where a that fan was like jumps school. over the penalty box. <laughs> Man, yeah. Like the old sl slap Buffalo, shot or something where they're climbing yeah. up there, the hit yeah. him with the keys to the camper. Yeah. Well, I think, I don't remember if it was Buffalo or it was the Ranger. It was back in the day, a fan got on the ice and started fighting someone. And they were, and the whole team is just wailing on him on the bench. And they were describing it in one of the post games. And the players like, yeah, I got give the guy credit. He hung in there for 15 good ones. That's just what, you know, you got to see these days. But Not hockey isn't as violent. Make hockey violent again, you know. With fans. No. No. With, with fans. If, no. if they choose, that, that's their choice. That's their choice. We're not endorsing it. If you want to get involved in the fight, you can do that. Yeah. Well, uh, I kind of want to flash back to your past a little bit, Anthony. I know you. we know about this. You've talked to us about this, but we obviously have listeners that might not, you know, know so much about this now, but – your first gig, I think you talked to us about back like I don't know, thirty years ago, was you did like a ringette. You like announced or called a ringette, <laughs> and, yeah. and here you are now, you know, announcing an NHL yeah. team. You're the head play-by-play -play guy for Minnesota Wild. I mean, that's just. I mean, how do you how do you go from being the ringette guy to yeah, how was, the Wild? Well, announcing? we got to start first. How 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 did the game work again? I remember it was yeah. What, yeah, it was, it's um. It, I have 
I might not remember all the details of the rules, but it was, yeah, this was, that was one of the low points of a broadcasting career for sure. It, it was, I'll never forget the, so I had been doing high school games, uh, volunteering at local cable companies. And I think at that time I had been hired. So I was probably, I don't know, I, my first like hired job with them when they were paying me 50 bucks a week to do two high school games and then do a weekly high school sports show called prep sports weekly. That was, it was and it was awesome. I loved it, but they decided they were going to do the world ring at tournament. So I had done a lot of other stuff. I mean, I had done the like high school volleyball, wrestling, soccer, football. You, if you could think of a sport, I've probably done it at one time. I did the international special Olympic soccer tournament. I did the, the USA cup soccer tourney. I did the state wrestling tournament. And so that one year they were going to do the world ringette tournament and ringette was like the precursor to women's hockey. So it was played by women, but they played with like a broom handle. So it was their stick didn't have a blade on either end. And the puck or the ring was like a rubber ring. I don't know. Let's say maybe a little bit bigger than a puck probably uh, in diameter, but it was a, it was a rubber ring and they would like, they could, I don't remember the rules, but they could skate like so many strides with the ring and then they'd have to pick it up and fling it or they could slide it on the ice to a teammate. And, and so the bottom line is it was the United States hosted the world ring at tournament. So they got to put a team in it and it was big in, in Europe at the time. So the final four was Sweden, Russia, Czechoslovakia, and the U S and the U S only was in it because they were the host. They were terrible. <laughs> and I was like, I'll do it, but I don't know anything about it. They said, that's okay. We got this gal from the, from the United States ring at foundation or federation or whatever they were called at the time. She will be your color guy. So we do the first semifinal game and it was, uh, the Russians against the Czechs and, you know, seven to five or something. And so then the next game is the U S against Sweden and the U S gets beat like, you know, 19 to zero or 19 to one or something. I mean, it was just a, they got absolutely crushed. Yeah. So I drive home and the next night I go down there to do the gold medal game and my analyst didn't show up because she was so pissed off at how the U S had played the day before that she like, just so they, up, up in arms with how bad they were performing. Have you got I it? guess. And so a little like, bit? <laughs> there was, the, I, she didn't, she just didn't come and I never talked to her. So I have no idea. Maybe she thought we were only going to do the gold medal game if the U S was in it or something. I, I really don't, I don't know, but the bottom line is, so I had to do the championship game by myself. It's Russia against Sweden. There's nobody from either side that speaks English. So I couldn't like really get any information from them before the game. I didn't yeah. really understand all the rules. So, I mean, some, their whistle would blow and I, well, I something just happened, happened but, guys, something right. Happened. Let's see if <laughs> and, this develops. Say. <laughs> yeah. And so the bottom line is the next year women's hockey kind of came to america so thankfully ringette never really caught on but i remember driving home from wakota arena what was then called wakota arena in south st paul that night and driving home in my car and, and honestly i can vividly remember the thought in my mind like i thought someday i was going to be announcing stanley cup hockey games and instead i'm doing world ringette stuff by myself on tape delayed local cable television I, I don't know if this is going to work out. I mean, it's the, it's honest to God, it's the only time I've ever can consciously remember the thought of like, maybe this isn't, maybe I'm not going to make it. And I mean, you know, I had dreamed of calling like the seventh game of a Stanley cup playoff series. I'd called all of them playing street hockey in my street and, and you know, mythical games and called the little table hockey games against my brothers and stuff. And, it was all more exciting than this world ringette game I had just done. And it was, that was a low point night for me for sure. And thankfully, thankfully things have things gone, turned, turned a little better for me. Yeah. Well, well to go full yeah. circle, maybe Bert should have announced uh ringette because of the tape delay. <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> been been safe there. The swearing. <laughs> Over, overcoming yeah. adversity at its finest though, I would say. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, and you know, look, I did a whole bunch of games and I've always told people, like I have people call me to, Hey, can you come and speak to our class and give them advice? And, and I have a lot of like 
college grads that'll say like, you know, how did you get to where you are? And I'm like, look, if, if that's the question you're asking, this probably isn't the line of work for you. I can mm-hmm. give you some advice on how to prepare for a show, how to the kind of things that I do to get ready every night for a broadcast. But if you're looking for like, what's the path to get there? There is no path. It's everybody's path is different. And Mm -hmm. for me, what it, what I always strive to do and I still do to this day is like, I tried to make every game sound like the seventh game of the Stanley cup finals. So if we were doing a Hill Murray white bear hockey game or a, Blaine versus Coon Rapids girls basketball game. I I tried to make it a big deal because I always felt like, well, to the people playing, it's a big deal. And therefore to people watching, it's a big deal. Otherwise they wouldn't be watching. So I never wanted to make it sound like I'm doing a, you know, high school soccer game where there's 34 people in the stands and it's raining. Who cares? Mm -hmm. I never wanted it to be like that. So even the ringette, I mean, I tried to like, I, I told him I'd do it, but I want it to be, good so i gotta get an analyst that knows what's going on because i I can memorize names and numbers but i mean i had done the wrestling i didn't know anything about wrestling but i i studied up and i learned what i could and and then i had a great analyst i I did the state wrestling tournament with a guy named jim bishi one time and he was phenomenal he knew everybody and so all i had to do was make sure i knew the rules the signals and so that i could describe what was happening and then just get out of the way and let him go but I knew to everybody that was watching the wrestling tournament, they were going to think it was, it was a huge deal. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I was never going to, I never ever, I can honestly say I've never just mailed it in where, because I thought the event didn't matter to me that I was going to bring less than at least my best. So, you know, that's, that's one piece of advice that I always give to people. And like, I, I th- I'd like to think that helped me land where I am that the fact that when I went to do the world ring at tournament, I wasn't just going to show up and wing it. I was trying to get prepared. Yeah. I just couldn't speak Swedish or Russian. So it was yeah. problematic. Well, that's the inspirational part, folks. If you're out there going for something and you're in your ring at right now, keep going. Yeah. Don't <laughs> half ass <laughs> it. Start if you're doing that right. damn ring at game, call it like it's the game seven of the Stanley cup where oh, millions yeah. of people are watching. Well, and it. that's, that's how the people, that's how a sport like that actually does, would grow though, is if announcers are taking yeah. it seriously. I mean, well, if tell, a sport the, is new and yeah. yeah, I'll tell you, I had one other, I did have one time where it actually tangibly led directly to a chance for me. I was, I got a call one summer from a guy at KFN and he was like, Hey, we're going to do MIC football games of the week next fall. And I'm wondering if you're interested. And, you know, I was an MIC guy. I went to St. John's and I had, I had done St. John's games on the radio while I was up there. I had since done like a, a weekly show on John Gillardi for a couple of years. So I was connected to the league and I was like, I absolutely am the guy for this job. And, but these were the kind of jobs that, you know, back then, communication internet was more limited like i would read about these things in the paper after they hired somebody and i'd always be like how the i didn't even know that was the job was available i'd have been perfect for that and so when this guy offered it to me and we got done talking and i was like yes i want to do it and and all the conversation ended i said well hey can i add just out of curiosity like how did you find me how did you how did you even know who i was And he said, I was at the state high school hockey tournament last year at the old St. Paul Civic Center. And I was watching the class A third place game. And it was Eveleth against somebody. I can't remember who it was. But and he said, I was standing there and and there's, you know, I don't know if you guys were ever in the old Civic Center, but it like there were in the press box, there were two rows of seats on each side of like the main TV booth. And during these state tournaments, there might be. 12 radio stations all doing the game but nobody had their own booth you were just sitting out on these rows of tables yeah. and but i mean there's a radio station from eveleth there's one from duluth there's one from mankato i mean there and, and i was doing the game for some station in the twin cities i don't even remember which station i was working for that year but he said i stood and i wandered around that press box and stood behind a bunch of broadcasts and he said i kept coming back to this guy calling the game and then when i found out i think it might have been working for wdgy which was like a like a hundred watt station in woodbury where you had to yeah. you would have had to be driving yeah. like within you know six blocks of the radio station to hear it yeah. but he said I, I this guy like 
he knew every player. He knew everything about these players. He's throwing in information about that you know, this guy just did this on this night, and this guy had this in the section final. And he said it sounded like I was listening to a Stanley Cup playoff game, and it was Eveleth against you know whoever in this Class A game. And I said, if I ever need a guy, that's the guy I want to call. And so I never met him that day. I never knew he was listening, but three months later he called me and offered me this job to do football. And, and it was, it's one story where you can actually point to just making sure that that night I made, I tried to make that, well, that game sound goal. as big time yeah. as I could. And you yeah, there it. we go. Yeah. That's huge. I, I, I was going to say like, but going back to that point of like not half assing it and going into, going into games, even if you don't know a lot, like my, I did, I did some play by play in college <laughs> And yeah. they they knew I was interested in it and like I wanted to do it, but they want to like get you involved in the background during the semester, like doing utility work and stuff before you get involved with it. The guy who did girls soccer got sick or something. They told me like three hours before the game, like you want to do play by play, right? I'm like, yeah. All right, you're doing soccer today. I'm like, oh. what? I I'm, I know a little bit about girls soccer. I don't. I mean, I know a lot of know a little about soccer in general. I don't know a lot about this team. I'm just showing up there rushing and prepping. And I was just, I, I was out there like I did, I did okay. But like I, when, when they scored, I used the word penetrate a lot. I used the word battle. Cause a lot of it was just back and forth. I'm like, I, I know offsides partially. And every time they scored, I'd be like, she shoots, she scores. Like it was a <laughs> damn hockey like game. Hockey. <laughs> I'm like, this is just, that doesn't sound like a soccer <laughs> broadcast, but thankfully I had a, an excellent, like, uh, uh, I think her name was, Haley Halverson, I think, was her name, but she was a woman soccer player. My God, if I did not have her, that that saved me so much. But yeah. it was just in, so intimidating. I had the same. I had the same thing. They asked me one year if I would do the International Special Olympic Soccer Tournament, and they, it was being hosted at Blaine that year. That it, the the Special Olympics were here in the cities. I I can't remember the year, but. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but the bottom line is they asked me if I could do it. I was like, you know, I really don't know anything about soccer, but I'll, I'd be, they said, don't worry. We've got an analyst who's great. I was like, all right. So I show up and my analyst is Seamus Mallon. And I had never heard of Seamus Mallon, but it turns out Seamus Mallon had done the world cup for ABC, oh. like oh, the oh, previous shit. year. Yep. Yeah. He was the, his normal job was he was the analyst for the New York Cosmos in, I, you know, I think at that time it was still the old North American soccer league, but yeah. whatever, like they were the premier team in the United States in that league. And I don't know how they got him to come here and do these games, but, and so we were doing the game and it was Cameroon, no, it wasn't Cameroon. I don't even remember who was playing, but it was like, it's our first show. And we were doing the, the special Olympics had, they played for like a week to then classify the teams into six levels because every country had a different definition of like what handicapped was. So for some, like they were in the special Olympics because they like had ADD basically. And then for, you know, at the low level, it was, it was people that were more significantly handicapped, but they didn't know how to do that. So they would play for like a week and then classify teams and say, okay, these guys are, in, are in level one, level two, up to level six. And level six was the least handicapped. It was like, it, it was, they were really talented. It was like, they might just have anger issues. Like I remember a guy getting like whistled for a foul and he just booted the ball. Like, into the crowd you know i mean that was so it was that kind of so, handicap yeah they they had different lo that's interesting right how you, so, how you facilitate that as yeah, a league right as a tournament and so the first game we're doing is the gold medal game in like the level four because we only did the four five and six and so they're you know they're handicapped but but still like very capable of playing it was a high level of soccer mm -hmm. we start the game and all of a sudden like the first ball gets kicked down the field and he, and all of a sudden Seamus Mallon with this heavy Irish accent is like, Oh, this is just like the center drive by Cameroon in the 94 world cup. And I was like, what in the world? I mean, I'm just, yeah. I'm hoping to just get the guy's names right. And I got, and yeah. so the rest of that show, it was like, we got to the first commercial break and I turned to him, I said, you talk whenever you want to talk and I'll fill yeah. in when there's dead airspace yeah. and that's it. And it was, it was, I, it, that was, it just reinforced what I had talked about before, where it was like, this is such a big deal to him that 
you know, I mean, I owe it to him to make sure when I get here tomorrow, I know everybody's name and number so that I don't ever screw up because he's going to be ready at a high level. And, you know, so it's, I, I think all those experiences are great. And, you know, the thing that your example hit home a little bit, because when I was working for KABL was the name of the cable company in White Bear Lake, really creatively named. I wanted our prep sports <laughs> weekly show to look like sports center. Yep. Nobody else there. I shouldn't say nobody. Very few guys there really cared. They, when it was five o'clock, they punched the clock and went home. So I did everything for the show. I learned how to edit. And I mean, I never went to school for any of that stuff because, you know, I, I was just wanted to be the announcer guy. So I never had, I learned how to edit. I learned how to build graphics. I, I did all the research. I wrote the shows. My dad and I built the desk for it so that it looked like a sports center desk. And, you know, I, I went in there and like learned how to do the lighting to make it all look great. And I wanted the show to look like sports center. And interestingly, like one of the guys that I, so I wanted to get analysts that were knowledgeable. One of the guys I called was Kevin Gorg and got him to come yeah. and be my hockey analyst. Nice. And yep. yeah, so it was, there were, I, I understand what you're talking about when you say like you had to learn all of it. Well, it makes you better because now to this yeah. day, like I have an idea what it takes to, for those guys in the truck to do what they're doing. Yep. So even though the equipment is totally different now, I, I I see it through their eyes a little bit. And I think that helps both of us. It, it makes me better at what I do. And I still like, I built, I write all the graphics for our shows and try to write them in a form. So they don't have to do any work instead of just sending them an email, like, Hey, why, let's build a graphic on the wilds power play the last seven games. Well, now they'd have to go do the research. So instead of doing that, I put the graphic together. Here's how I think it could work. We have really talented people in our truck here. Like our, our show is, I'll put it up there with any, for sure, any local show. And most of you watch hockey on NBC, their national shows, uh, the production level for ours is better. Our guys are outstanding and they're really creative with it. But I like to minimize their work and say, here's 25 graphics. I think we maybe could use tonight. We might only use five of them, depending on what happens in the game, but I still prepare it every night and try to prepare it so that they it's plug and play for them. And you know, yeah. I, I think that I think that it's invaluable experience to learn all that behind the scenes stuff. It's got to be super awesome to have a play by play guy who understands the whole production holistically, because exactly that way, you know, you're not just like, all right, you guys figure it out. You know, you kind of understand what they need to do and how much time it takes and and kind of from their point of view. I'd imagine they, they probably appreciate that greatly compared to having a guy who's like, I'm just here to talk. So, so yeah, yeah. I have no idea what you guys go. You got to figure it out. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no doubt. And it's a two way street because those guys are, you know, they're they're really good at what they do. And like our graphics guy is he's unbelievably talented. He was he. So when I send him this stuff, then he dresses it up and does the Mm -hmm. cutouts of the players and makes it artistic and everything. And that I can do the statistical side and do the research for him. And and I'm. I'm good with numbers. I'm, you know, even just today, Ryan Carter is doing the game with me tonight and we're talking back and forth about some things we want to talk about. Well, I always just tell him, look, you tell me what you'd like to talk about. I'll do the research to find the stats to support you. I can do it a lot faster than you can. And instead of you wasting two hours trying to find out how many goals per 60 minutes, Victor Rass scores compared to other members of the wild, just shoot me a text. I can look it up fast. I know how to manipulate those sites because I spend time on them. And that way you can focus on building a video package that supports what you're trying to say. And so, you know, in fact, that that was our interaction today because we're coming off of a, a night where Victor Rask had a big night. We're going to talk about him tonight. So I came up with a couple graphics that will support what he wants to talk about. And then he went through some old video and Hey guys in the truck here, I'd like to show this clip, this clip, this clip, highlight this guy here, circle this guy here, draw an arrow going this way. And so now we all can work together on it and kind of play to our strengths and everybody having an understanding on how it works makes that all work so much better. Yeah. And while we're on the subject of the production, I mean, people don't understand how much it goes into it, but what, what's it like doing it from the, from the, uh, from the arena and away games is, do you prefer it or, I mean, no, no, it sucks. It, it really sucks. It's, um, 
And for a couple reasons, one is it's just hard to call. We don't have like a secret monitor that shows us everything. We see exactly what, what you see. What we see. Yeah. yeah. The that, same that exact thing. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, it, it's tough because there'll be, there'll probably be 10 plays a night that I just can't see what, like a puck will go out front and I didn't know a guy was there. Like they're, they're focused on a scrum in the corner and all of a sudden a guy grabs the puck and just whips it toward the net. And you'll be like, well, if I'm watching the game live in person, I see that Ryan Suter's breaking up the slot. But when I'm watching it on the monitor, I don't see that. So I'm like, well, what is he doing? And then all of a sudden, all you see is like the finish of a left-handed shot guy. Well, that could be Suter. It could be Brodeen. It could be Ian Cole. I don't know. It's a lefty with a number two to start his number. Yeah. And it, so you find yourself like, you know, you're really waiting because you want to be right. And so you have to try to find ways to just keep talking for a minute until you see who it is. And I so that part of it is is I don't like it at all. I you're really totally spend a lot of time it. watching what's happening elsewhere on the ice. And so like when we do a home game and we're here, even though there's no fans, we're at least in the building and it's mm -hmm. somewhat back to normal. But the other part of it that that is that really takes away from it is that we get a lot of information when you're around the players and we just haven't been able to be around them at all this year. And a big part of that is when we get out of our hometown and we're on the road, because now you're on the bus with those guys, you're on the plane with them, you bump into them in the hotel lobby or the coffee shop, or you go to practice on the off day. And when there's not really anybody else around, that's where you get the, 10 minutes standing out by the bus with Ryan Suter, just chatting about life in general. And you get so much more background information on guys that this year we've just had none of that because, you know, we have zoom calls with them, but that's not the same. And yeah. you're on the zoom call with the other writers and everything, and they're not going to say anything in front of the writers. And you, you know, so it's the times on the road are the times where you really get that kind of stuff. And I mean, like, you know, this year we've got some new players I've never met him. I've never met Cam Talbot. I've never met Marcus Johansson. And yet, you know, we're, we'll probably finish the season without really ever having a face-to-face -face conversation with those guys. And that's really hard. So it's, there's two, it's the watching the game and trying to call it off the monitor, but it's also just the lack of interaction with the guys that really make the broadcast a lot tougher. And hopefully, and I don't think it will be the norm, but, you know, hopefully by next season, we're back to what we used to be and doing things the way we used to do them. Cause it, it, it it's just so much fun. And I miss like being in these other rinks and yeah, like listening yeah, to that, the Anthem yeah. at the United center in Chicago. Yeah. And, and there's just nothing like some of those atmospheres. And, and we just haven't been able to be a part of that at all this year. Well, as you were describing that, I think it would probably suck to just be at the mercy of the cameramen to you make know, sure I was, they I, capture everything. I was going to say, because I've seen some broadcasts where I'm like, what is this camera yeah, guy doing? the camera doing? guy looks like he's drunk so or something. So it's like trying to announce this, I'm, I could – this would be brutal. Like you can only do as much as, as the, as the yeah. video you have. I can't imagine yeah. zooming in that. too far and then yeah. – Well, it's not yeah. only that, but it's just like the way – the camera guys are – you know, they're typically – they're they're decent you know the our guys here in town are yeah. are some of the best and so like when it's stanley cup playoffs a few of our guys get hired by the national crews to go and and do games elsewhere but it's more just you know the producer and director have to be so like right now our guys don't even control they can't tell the camera guys what they want them to shoot we because tonight's game's in san jose we just get the feed from San Jose and we'll have, we have two cameras there. I think that where our guy gets to control them that he uses for like cutaway shots. Like, Hey, get me a shot of Dean Evison. Cause our guys are talking about Dean Evison. And whereas normally if they're doing the show with us, whatever we talk about and they'll tell us like, Hey, I'm coming out of break. I'm going to have a shot of this guy, then this guy. And, but now we're kind of at the mercy of what they send us and all the producers and directors kind of got together at the start and agreed to work together on stuff where try to shoot your game a little more neutral in terms of how many times you show the wild bench compared to the sharks bench, because both broadcasts are using that, but it's also the replay packs and stuff. So like a play happens. Well, our guys, if we're at home, they'll tell us, okay, we're going to take three looks at that last deflection out front. 
where now it's, hey, they just told us they're coming back to show us that chance. Well, they might be showing it from a totally different perspective than what we would because they're mm-hmm. isolating the defensemen of the Sharks where we would be trying to show the wild forward going to the net. And so we're really at the mercy of that. And then, you know, directors, they can be more artistic if the game is being played in our rink because they know that I can still see it. So they can cut to a tight shot in the corner where guys are really battling and they can get you that emotional shot of, you know, the where you see the intensity on their face because they know if the puck goes out in front that I'm still going to be able to see it. But now when I'm watching the monitor, you can't do that because – well, I, I mean, yeah, that's great to see those guys like, you know, yelling at each other, but the, there's a scoring chance going on right now and, yeah. and we can't see yeah. it to tell you what happened. So it, it's a, it's not an ideal spot. It's in, you know, but we're all, we're all making the best of it. And it's really like, if the alternative was, is to be unemployed during a pandemic, I'll take this. Oh yeah. Well, and add it to your list of experiences, ring out right, exactly. calling the game from the TV position. In yep. a pandemic, it'd be incredible. Yeah. I, I, before we get into like the rapid fire, so we need to wrap this up. I, I, I know one thing that would flare up the broadcast, though. Mm-hmm. We, we got to hear whenever Nick Benino scores. When it hey, happens. Benino, 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 Benino. <laughs> Roll the soccer, the <laughs> soccer <laughs> twist. Well, on yeah. It. When, when are we gonna? When, when are we gonna hear that? Well, he's only got one goal, so yeah, you know so we not we'd have um. I'll have to we'll have to see if we can work something like that in. I'm. Uh, I don't know that that one's going to fit, but we'll see. Something yeah. like that along those lines. Yeah, well, you'll crazy. take it as a suggestion, yeah. right? Suggestion. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll put the, <laughs> we'll file that list. one away as the you know things we're thinking about. Okay. We'll we'll be listening when Benino scores again. We're like, okay, what do they have? If it's yeah. on Fox Sports North, we're going to be like, okay, what's <laughs> turn it, turn up the volume, do? turn up the volume. Let's see what they do. Yeah. yeah. But well, uh, yeah. as as Jake mentioned, uh, Anthony, we're going to get into the rapid fire segment. I know you remember doing this back in May. We've changed up a few of the questions. Some of them are the same, but uh, okay. Ten questions as fast as you can go. First thing that pops in your in your head. Are you ready? I'm ready. All Let's right, go. rapid fire, Anthony Lapanta. Okay, deserted island. Uh, you're on a deserted island all by yourself. A ship washes up to shore with one type of alcohol in it that you get for the rest of your time on the island. What is it? Uh, Chianti. Nice. Is that is that uh, wine or wh- yeah, red wine. Okay, yeah, Italian red wine, red wine gotcha. Sangiovese grape. I'll take uh, I'll take mm-hmm. unlimited Chianti for the rest of my time on the island. Yeah, meat sauce said red wine too. So yep. you're you're in that maybe same the boat. same island. Uh, how many fourth graders are you gonna fend off in self defense? How many could I fend off? Yeah. Uh, whew, I don't know. I'll say twelve. Ooh. Twelve. Okay. Lieber said seven. We always compare everyone to Lieber. Ben <laughs> Lieber. He said seven, but who knows? Seven. Maybe some... Yeah, it depends on if they're armed. I guess if they're yeah. just yeah. you know no coming weapons. at me with 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 no weapons, I think I could I think I could withstand a dozen. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, no weapons. More of like uh, hangry with no lunch, and uh, they haven't had their nap yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you prefer Minneapolis or St. Paul? Uh for are you talking like for a night out? What's Oh, interesting. Uh, just maybe overall, what city do you like better? Well, if it's if we're talking, I I I love St. Paul, but if we're talking about like going and having dinner and spending the night out mm-hmm. you know, on the town, then I'll go to Minneapolis. Right. Sure. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would you rather slap a random baby or your own grandmother? Um. Well, my grandmothers are no longer alive, so I guess. Maybe they wouldn't be as offended if I slapped them, but if they were still alive, I guess I'd probably slap a random baby because I wouldn't want to. Neither one of my grandmothers were people you'd want to get on the bad side of. Well, and yeah, remember yeah. it is a random baby, so that, yes, that yeah, baby will right. not. Remember, it won't hold grudges. It won't well, it depends that. on how many fourth graders are guarding that baby. I guess. I mean, True. If yeah, right. If maybe there's like the if side. there's fourteen of them, then I I better go with my grandma. How many okay. do you got to get through? Yeah, maybe they're working together after that. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, would you rather walk to work, so to the X, in high heels, or drive your car and work reverse? Oh, drive my car in reverse for sure. Yeah. Yeah, heels are terrible. No. I, I've i never. Especially in the, it. I can't imagine walking in them in the snow would be very much fun, and it's a, it'd be a long walk. I'd rather take my time and drive backward. 
I don't know if you guys were, maybe this was a me thing. You put your mom's heels on as a kid just to see what they feel like, and you're like, oh, fuck this, my calves. <laughs> okay, yeah, I've done that, but I was like five or six. I'm yeah, like, no, but still, I'm yeah. like, yeah. this isn't, this, I could Well, I mean, I live yeah. about 15 miles away from here. That would be a long walk. That, yeah, yeah, that's also, it. All it's nope. all dependent on location as well. Nope. And if you play enough Grand Theft Auto, you might be able to drive in reverse, too. Yep. Um, so would this is a new one. Would you rather never be stuck in traffic again or never catch a cold again? Uh, I guess I'd rather never catch a cold again. Although I don't really catch very many colds these days. So yeah, I'll say, I'll still say that. I guess I'd always prefer health. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It makes well, sense. And traffic's yeah. not, traffic's not really it's that not, bad. If you got a good right now, it's not, I mean, like I don't even one. remember what traffic is like. Yeah. Yeah. Get a, yeah. Right now it doesn't even, no, not even doesn't, relevant. doesn't even really exist. Yep, doesn't exist. Uh, if you were given an all expenses paid trip to Cleveland, would you take it? Absolutely. Exo yeah. Steakhouse is one of my top five steakhouses in America in downtown Cleveland, in between the ballpark and the hotel. I'd go there in a heartbeat. Yeah. Well, it's all about it's all about the experience, right? If you, yeah. have, yep. if you have your if you have your spots, then you're set. Sounds like you need to yep. get a blog out of your top 10 steakhouses in, yeah, in America. Mount Rush, Mount, yeah, your Mount Rushmore of steakhouses in America. That would be an interesting. Yes. One. Yeah. I well, the Exo in Cleveland would be in the top five. Nice. Okay. All right, good to know. Um, what's more realistic, ghosts or aliens? Um, is that are you talking like movies or like actual ghosts or aliens? We're talking real life. Yeah. Oh, real life. Well, it's yeah. interesting. My kids have been are convinced that aliens are real. Like they, we just had this debate over the holidays that I got a daughter who's a freshman in college who was absolutely convinced that there was that alien life was a part of the Egyptians building the pyramids. And she has like, it's like crazy. She has this stuff that they, like they stumbled on the same mathematical equation as the Aztecs did at the same time, roughly the same time frame. And so she is, so I'm going to say aliens are more real because my kids are absolutely convinced that there has been and will be more alien presence on earth. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, totally. Uh, would you rather have to always wear one rollerblade on your foot or have someone walking in front of you that's going slightly slower than you want to go? Uh, well, I would for sure just have somebody walking slower than one rollerblade. That seems like that would be a – that seems like that would be miserable. <laughs> yeah, total pain in the ass. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I mean, both options I mean, are, but if you can speed work, is yeah. one thing. If, 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 you can, if you can roll your way around a rollerblade, I mean – but that probably would, get Yeah, good but the, it, right? only one leg, it seems like that <laughs> yeah. would get – that would get old pretty fast. The uneven, yeah. unbalanced. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, what we said with Gorg is like, when you'd be on TV, you'd have to like bend one of your legs because your feet would be at different heights. Because the roller blades have to be, have this crooked wheels on it. It'd be brutal. Yeah. 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 It would be weird. Um, if a movie was made about your life, who's playing you? Ooh. Um. Boy. Never thought about that before. I would say. Who would you um, want to play you? That always makes it. That always makes it a little easier. Yeah, uh, maybe Robert De Niro. I mean, stick with the Italians, I guess. I mean, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd say I'd probably go with him. It's. Um, I've been. I've t been told by people that they think I my broadcasting style is similar to Chris Fowler of ESPN. So, you know, I don't know if he's counts as like an actor capable of being in a movie. I'm sure he could do it and. You know, but uh, I guess if it's an actor, I'd go either either Robert De Niro or maybe like Matthew Perry. I could see mm -hmm. like yeah. with kind of a little sarcastic side to him that might fit me too. Well, and you could dress the part, right? You got the black the black coat on, the white button up. You look like you yeah. go to an Italian steakhouse yeah. right yeah. now. And talk yeah, the about only thing and like De Niro, he <laughs> like I I've never had a cigarette, so he'd have to like some of the stuff that like I think of him like in Midnight Run and and the you know mafia type roles, you know the Godfather. I mean, mm -hmm. like he's got that's not a part of me, but I'm sure he'd be able to pull it off. I'd be honored if it was Robert De Niro. How about that? Yeah, I would. I that's would a too. good pick. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Well, Anthony, we've had a blast. Uh, you do have a wild game to call in a few hours, but any uh, any final words for the viewers before we sign off? No, just uh, enjoy the games and try not to be too critical of the guys trying to call them off a TV monitor. 
Yeah, especially if the color guy says an F word on accident. Which, <laughs> yeah. You never know, yeah. know what's going to happen next. <laughs> or, or the radio yeah, guys. Hopefully, yeah. I, hopefully I've had the last one of those. Yeah. Or, or the radio guys throwing out hashtag mute TV. Yeah, yeah whatever, I can ignore whatever those guys. Really means yeah. Down. yeah, irrelevant. Yeah, Anthony, this has been a blast. And for those of you listening out there, watch the wild games, support the broadcasters. They're they're trying their hardest when they're doing the when they're watching TV and trying to announce it. Like like Anthony said, they're doing it just the way you are at home. You know, they're watching the same broadcast. So either uh, try to do it better or shut up. That's what that's what <laughs> exactly. we're gonna say. To it. All right, yeah, folks. We're, yeah, what were you gonna say? No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's it's just like I used to do when I was a kid where I'd sit and watch the North Star games on TV and call the play-by-play. So now I'm doing yeah. it for real. Exactly. If you want to do it better, do what Fall in the Says, mute TV, and maybe you can try to do it. But Yeah, yeah give it a yeah. shot. Yeah, <laughs> See what happens. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 